We have a jam-packed webinar here for you to discuss the equipment and instruments for the cannabis and botanicals market. Uh, thank you for joining us and commemorating uh, Hemp History Week. My name is George Rivera. I'm an engineer and sales manager for T-Equipment.net. And joining me is uh, Mark Diener, product manager for Jalabo uh, USA. Uh, Mark, are you there? Yes. Hello, everyone. Okay. And, hi. And uh, Mark will be discussing the extraction distillation processes and how their equipment fits in. Uh, we're also happy to welcome from Adam Equipment, Marsha O'Donnell, uh, Regional Sales Manager, and Tim McGinnis, National Sales Manager. Uh, Marsha and Tim, are you there? I am. We sure are. Great. Uh, they'll be discussing weighing scales and some of their models to consider. Uh, before turning over the presentation to Mark, uh, while we're waiting for any late joiners to the webinar, I had a couple of slides about our company to show you. So uh, our company is about 16 years old. Uh, we have become a very large stocking distributor. We really do take to heart the slogan, uh, buy from people, not just the internet. And we have a qualified staff here to help you. And as you can see from this slide, uh, as a national and international distributor, we cover the needs of a wide variety of customer types on the left side. And on the right side gives you some not all, but uh, so at least some of the products and instruments that we carry. Uh, in total, we carry uh, well over a million, half a million products. Our company has invested heavily in making the website a great resource. Uh, on the left side here, you can see the filtering capability by specifications to narrow down your search. And on the right side is a screenshot of an internal portal that we have for better customer service. We're constantly enhancing our uh, website and internal systems to provide a better experience for our customers. Uh, that just covers what I wanted to uh, give. Uh, and uh, Mark, let me uh, uh, transfer the control over to you. Okay. There we go. All right. It should, yeah, we see your slides there. Okay. Yep, we All see right. you guys. Um, you say, okay, thank you for inviting me to uh, participate in this, George. Uh, I'm uh, Mark Diener, the product manager with Ulabo USA. Uh, we manufacture liquid temperature control units, and I would like to focus on the use of our products for the cannabis extraction workflows. Just a little bit about our company. We are a German-owned, fa a German family-owned company. Last year, we celebrated our 50th anniversary, and this year, Ulabo USA is celebrating its 25th anniversary. Um, so we provide liquid temperature control solutions. Uh, the fun way we like to say it or put it is, we we heat things up and cool them down, always through a fluid. Um, our product portfolio ranges with the capacity, uh, capability that is of minus 95. To 350 degrees Celsius, um, the maximum of 29 kilowatts of cooling power and up to 36 kilowatts of heating power. Um, so for today's topic in the cannabis workflow, I'd like to focus and walk us through um, the extraction processes, in particular the three main ones that are on the market, um, supercritical CO2, ethanol, and liquefied hydrocarbon. Um, then move on to a slight dis small discussion on winterization. And then subsequent to that, if you winterize, everything's in ethanol, so then you need to evaporate. Uh, so we'll touch on rotary evaporation and then also a centrifugal evaporator. And then finally for isolation to both either um, the extract THC or CBD components, um, that is accomplished by vacuum distillation. So let's dive into uh, supercritical CO2 extraction. Uh, this slide gives a diagram of a single pass um, generic CO2 extractor system. And in this system, the, uh, they require a recirculating chiller of a certain capacity, depending on the size, to cool the CO2 supply prior to it um, entering the pump where it goes into this supercritical or subcritical phase. Uh, most systems on the market now are closed loop, so after the um, extraction cell 
uh, and the extract comes out, there is a low pressure zone that enables the CO2 to go back into its gaseous state. Um, that particular phase change um, has a cooling effect, and therefore um, there's another zone that is jacketed that would require um, a warmer um, temperature from a circulator to remove that cooling effect. And then the CO2 is recycled um, through the system. So TCUs for uh, supercritical fluid uh, extraction can consist of a recirculating chiller or a heating circulator or a recirculating chiller that has some heating ca capability. And um, the temperatures required for these systems are not extreme. Uh, they're generally at uh, 40 degrees or lower. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind is that depending on the size of the extraction system, the flow rate for the fluid on the chiller can be crucial. Um, some systems on the market today actually have two different flow requirements um, for the different uh, sections of the apparatus. So be sure to pay attention to the chiller flow requirements when you are looking at um, recirculating chillers. Typical fluids used for these systems are either water or water glycol. Uh, the benefit for water glycol is you don't have to worry about algal growth or any um, bacterial growth in the, in the uh, system. Um, what we're seeing in the marketplace is as it has matured, particularly in states that have been legalized for a period of time, um, everybody's going to larger and larger. They want to have larger throughput and more capacity. And so that means that they need to have circulators with um, higher cooling power. Um, in fact, some manufacturers have discontinued uh, man selling their small CO2 systems that they entered into the marketplace years ago. Um, but as we move to larger systems, what does this mean? You know, you're going to have systems then with uh, chiller requirements of 5, 10 or kilowatt or even more cooling power. And from a facility perspective, uh, that means that you will need to have a site with um, three-phase power. So in our portfolio, we have a range of recirculating chillers. Um, the F-Series are our basic models. We have three systems up to a kilowatt of cooling power at 20 degrees C. And then a more sophisticated model line with 22 models all the way up to uh, 20 kilowatts of cooling power. Um, these can be uh, air-cooled or water-cooled. And we can also equip these with heating options for extended temperature ranges. So see, these are some of the solutions that we have uh, for supercritical fluid extraction systems. OK, moving on to ethanol extraction. Um, there are a wide variety of methods and scale in the marketplace. Nothing standardized. It's kind of like the wild, wild west as far as ethanol extraction is concerned. Um, for today's discussion, we'll focus on jacketed vessel methodologies whether that be a reactor or a holding tank or something. Um, but the temperature control is enabled by the use of double-walled vessels. So the temperature control unit circulates a fluid to the jacket on the vessel, affecting the temperature um, for the extraction process. So in this methodology, um, ethanol is added to the vessel and pre-chilled, usually less than zero degrees Celsius, plant material, added for a period of time, either removed or filtered, to isolate the ethanol extract. The big benefit of cold temperature ethanol extraction is that it, it eliminates the need for winterization. So that can eliminate an extra step in the process um, for isolating a, a cannabis extract, um, reducing the time to, um, to getting that extract. And what we're seeing um, in the industry are requests for minus 40 degrees C or even lower as the uh, marketplace matures. Um, typically, temperature control fluids used for this are either ethanol, glycol water, or silicone oils. Um, some things to keep in mind, though, is that, you know, uh, if you want to go to minus 40 or lower, you won't be able to utilize glycol water because it'll um, pretty much freeze. Um, the use of ethanol in some systems just check with the, the TCU manufacturer because some units cannot utilize ethanol. Silicon oils are, are nice to use because they have a wide temperature range and a, a very good uh, viscosity for pumping. So let's expand upon the ethanol extraction a little bit and um, review an example. Uh, let's say you have a 20 liter vessel that you want to conduct ethanol extraction in at a target temperature at minus 40 degrees C. 
So if you look at our portfolio, uh, you might focus on this particular model, the FP40HL. Um, from a specification perspective, it has a nice temperature range of minus 40 to 200 degrees C, and, and it supplies 680 watts cooling power at 20. Um, so f uh, initially it looks attractive, but you need to focus on the capacity of the system at the target temperature. In this case, the FP40HL only has 40 watts of cooling power at minus 40. On a 20 liter vessel, you will never be able to get to minus 40 in this case. So the important thing to look for is a TCU that has the adequate cooling power at minus 40. Um, in this case, we could look at a Presto A80. Um, you'll see that the temperature range is much broader, but the, the important fact is that it has 1.1 kilowatts of cooling power at minus 40 degrees C, which is adequate cooling power for a 20 liter application um, for a minus 40 degrees C ethanol extraction. You know, size matters. So the larger you go with the volume, the larger your chiller is going to need to be as far as a capacity perspective. Um, you know, if you are currently working with a 10 liter system and you want to scale up to a 50 or 100 uh, liter system, the chiller that you have on a 10 liter system is just not going to be adequate um, on those larger, on the larger applications. So some things to avoid is uh, to look beyond the operating range. Uh, you know, what does it mean? Pri on the prior slide example, right, if you want to cool it, extract at minus 40, don't choose a ch circulator that just has a low temperature limit of minus 40. The reason being is that uh, when chillers are spec'd, their cooling power is uh, rated at, at 20 degrees C, and they usually give a total operating range. But given the fact that uh, refrigeration systems as they drop in temperature, the cooling power lowers. So you need to look at uh, systems that have adequate power at the desired operating range. Okay, moving on now to liquefied hydrocarbon extraction. Uh, this is a generic schematic showing the, the process where you have your storage and recovery tank with the, that with the liquefied hydrocarbon goes over to the extraction column where then it goes into the evaporator or collection vessel which has lower pressure, the um, liquefied hydrocarbon undergoes a phase change to the gaseous state here where the vacuum pump and moves on to the recovery pump for uh, phase change back to um, liquid state and keeps cycling through. Um, most units on the market today have the storage and recovery tanks jacketed, uh, which would require a low temperature circulator and the collection vessels are also jacketed, and this would have a heating circulator because as the liquefied hydrocarbon goes from liquid to gas, um, it will cool down and we need to remove that um, cold temperature. So some of our products that are typically used on the collection vessels are shown here. Um, the temperature requirements aren't very uh, great. It's usually 40 to 60 degrees Celsius. It's more a matter of scale. Um, some of our more popular items are the Corio CDBC6 and the 230 volt version that has two kilowatts of heating power. Um, or if they desire three kilowatts, the, the SL12 model is a nice uh, product for this application. The benefit is that if um, someone has an SL12 model and they go up to a larger system, there is a, nine, a six kilowatt booster heater accessory that would give a total of nine kilowatts of heating power. Um, this type of unit would be used, for example, on a collection vessel that might be like 100 liter in size. Then on the cold side, for the storage recovery tanks, um, most processors target a temperature of minus 40 degrees C. And one of our most popular items is uh, the FP50HL, um, which has 160 watts at minus 40 degrees C. But we're seeing a trend for people wanting to go colder, in minus 60 or lower, and or larger scale, which then requires more cooling power. Um, one example in our portfolio is the FPW91 SL over here, which has two kilowatts of cooling power at minus 60. Uh, we have many other ultra-low uh, circulators available with a range of cooling power 
and temperatures is available also. And as, as the market has matured, um, with these larger extraction systems, uh, the recovery pump in line, since it's compressing the gas, it creates a lot of excess heat um, in the hydrocarbon. So uh, some systems might actually have a pre-cooling zone prior to the storage recovery tank. Um, if the apparatus is equipped with this, then um, this pre-cooling zone would require another um, low temperature circulator to pre-chill the um, hydrocarbon. So once you have your um, extract perf extraction performed, if you have uh, undesirables in the extract that you want to remove, winterization is required. Where an, uh, a concentrated solution of the extract in ethanol is chilled, which then precipitates the unwanted plant materials, and then those are removed via filtration. Typically, this is done in jacketed vessels or other, uh, other devices like that, um, where the solution is then cooled to minus 20 or lower um, before the filtration is done. Uh, the vessel size is going to determine, determine the circulator size. So here I've shown just some, some systems that could be used in this application. Um, the CD600F, for example, is a nice benchtop unit that has 220 watts of cooling power at minus 20. Now this would be suitable for a small uh, winterization op operation, maybe up to like five liters in size. And then we have a range of systems with increasing capacity at, at even lower temperatures that can facilitate the winterization process. Okay, once you uh, winterize and filter, everything is in ethanol, and then that needs to be removed. Um, by, by far the most popular method is using a rotary evaporator. Now, one thing in the market is that cannabis users um, desire uh, condenser temperature below 20 degrees Celsius. Um, that's so that um, they can utilize a temperature in the bath tank where the ethanol solution, the extract is, is, is below 60 degrees C. They want to um, minimize the heat exposure of the extract to minimize any um, thermal degradation. Um, so for benchtop systems that can accommodate up to a 5-liter flask, uh, we have some models that are, are good for benchtop rotovaps, and shown here is the F1000 system, which has a kilowatt of cooling power at 20. Um, but uh, if people that are processing more material per day or per batch will want to go to a larger rotovap, in the case of a 20-liter system, our FL4003 chiller is ideal for this as it has one and a half kilowatts at minus 10. And if you go even larger up to a 50 liter rotovap, um, our seven kilowatt circulator, the FL7006, has three kilowatts at minus 10 degrees C. Um, so we have a wide range of chillers that can accommodate rotary evaporator applications. Another way to remove the ethanol is a batch process. That is, if you have a reactor, you pull a vacuum on it, and you do a distillation that way. Um, the um, size of the recirculating chiller for the condenser is going to be, depend on the volume, the required cooling capacity, obviously, and the dis desired distillation rate. And we can help determine um, which size chiller will work best for your process based on the volume of ethanol uh, being distilled. Um, just for an example, if you have a 100 liter system to do a vacuum distillation of ethanol, that would require our 20 kilowatt chiller, the FL20006. Um, this has six kilowatts of cooling power at minus 10 degrees C. Again, it's all dependent upon um, how much ethanol you want to distill per hour, and then we can work with you to determine the, the ideal um, solution. Um, taking a different approach to ethanol evaporation is the uh, uh, centrifugal evaporator. Uh, Yulabo is a distributor of the Rocket 4D Synergy system. Um, this is an, a really nice um, product in that it does automated feed and unattended ethanol evaporation. Basically, you have these containers over here where you take your winterized ethanol solution. It automatically feeds into the rotor of the centrifuge, does the evaporation uh, where the condensate comes back down into here. So you can just set a touch a button, 
set it and forget it. Due to the um, centrifugal force, there's no bumping, which is something that if you manually operate a rotary evaporator, you have to be cognizant of. Um, this five, it has a five liter bowl insert, which you can see here. So after your um, extract solution has been evaporated, you would have your ethanol uh, re residue in here, or your extract residue rather. Um, you could simply pull that bowl out, pop another one in, and uh, get the process going on the next batch. Now, the nice thing is it is 24-7 uh, operation, and we have several extractors in, in the market that are utilizing these. So once you've ev evaporated your ethanol, or you have your extract concentrated, then you want to isolate the components, whether THC or CBD. Um, that is typically conducted by a vacuum distillation. Uh, Benchtop systems or short paths are usually conducted with a, a round bottom flask type apparatus with a short path distillation head and a, a cowl with collection vessels. Um, a heating mantle provides the heat, but then you have a condenser up here um, that needs a circulator. Um, since THC and CBD are high boiling materials, uh, this could be a small heating circulator or a benchtop refrigerated heating circulator. Uh, depending on what temperature you would like to have the condenser set to. But for um, processors that are doing larger volumes, um, it is definitely beneficial to move to a, a white film still uh, apparatus. So as you can see here, um, this um, has a lot of temperature control uh, systems on it, as there are, in, in this case, there are three different uh, heating circulators for heating zones, whether it be the the feed port, the feed lines, obviously the, the distillation jacket needs to be heated, and then two refrigerated heating circulators. One would be uh, for cooling the condenser inside the still, and then maybe another one for um, a vapor trap um, prior to the uh, diffusion pump. Um, the benefit of a white film still is that they can be continuous and uh, very highly reproducible after you optimize your conditions. Uh, depending on the size of the white film still, there could be um, you know, fewer or more temperature control units that are needed um, to heat or cool the various components. So just to give you a, a little bit of a summary, um, the supercritical fluid carbon dioxide, ethanol, and liquefied hydrocarbon Extraction processes all utilize liquid, uh, liquid temperature control in some manner, whether it's cooling, cooling, uh, heating, or heating and cooling in the different zones. If you need to do winterization, then in ethanol, then the cooling is required for that. And then obviously, it, since the uh, winterization involves a solution of ethanol, we need to do a distillation, which um, then also requires um, uh, recirculating chillers for the condensers. And then finally, um, after that um, ethanol has been removed, we have the extract, then um, high vacuum distillation is conducted to isolate the components for the uh, final uh, product. Isolation, whether it's CBD or THC. So just like to give you a little background on Ulava product support, all of our systems include a two-year or 10,000-hour return to factory warranty to our facility in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Um, we have li uh, live service technicians on the phone every day until five o'clock Eastern time, so you won't get some um, buddy in another country answering your phone call. We do offer extended warranties at the time of purchase for one or two additional years, um, in addition to service contracts with on-site options. Given regulations for the industry um, in certain states uh, that require NLTL marking, either in the U.S. or Canada, we can have um, NRTL products, uh, marked products um, for an additional cost. So some things to keep in mind about liquid temperature control in the extraction process um, is to properly size the TCU. I mean, you want to be able to have reproducible, consistent results. You know, time is money, and if your TCU goes down, uh, that hurts um, your throughput and your revenue at the end of the day. So purchasing from a, a notable 
reliable TCU manufacturer that can provide both pre-sale consultation and more importantly, post-sale services and support is very crucial for your operation. And some things to keep in mind um, if you're looking around for a, a new temperature control unit is uh, size matters. If you have uh, some of this information ahead of time, it will greatly facilitate um, us to help you determine what product you need. You know, so, uh, what temperature range do you need? What cooling and or heating capacity is required at that particular temperature? So with T Equipment and your labo, please contact T Equipment for any of your liquid temperature control needs. Um, we will work together with you. George and his team are very good at pulling me in regarding um, working on capacity or time to temperature calculations so that we can size the proper unit for your particular workflow. So thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions. If there's any questions, uh, just put them in the chat window. Um, there's um, one already that uh, had happened earlier, uh, Mark. Uh, you talked about uh, water-cooled and air-cooled units. So does that mean you use tap water uh, for the water-cooled? And... Yeah, some uh, our, some systems have refrigeration systems that use the, um, uh, tap water or facility um, like if there's a whole system, a whole facility chilling system, um, then that would uh, reject the heat from the uh, refrigeration system. Just my own question, what, what's the benefit of, of those types of water-cooled units over the air-cooled? Well, if you have, let's say, for example, if you had a 20 kilowatt chiller, um, that is, if you had an air-cooled system, that is going to put out probably over 30 kilowatts of heat into the room. And if your HVAC system doesn't have the capability to remove that heat, um, the room will eventually warm up. So a water-cooled system, you don't have that heat rejection into the atmosphere in, in, inside the room where the TCU is located. Okay, thanks for the explanation. Uh, one other question. Uh, so what should operators look out for when uh, the TCU when using the TCU for a cold application? Yeah, depending on, uh, you know, which bath fluid is used, uh, I would recommend monitoring the water content. Um, if you are in an area of the country that is uh, humid, um, atmospheric moisture can condense into the fluid um, at subambient conditions. You know, if you're using uh, ethanol or water glycol, periodic monitoring of the contents via hydrometer can tell you, oh, I'm increasing my uh, water content. Um, and systems that are using silicone fluids, uh, silicone oil and water aren't miscible, and the water will um, freeze on the condensation coils, or you might see cloudiness in a jacketed system if it's glass. Um, so then you'd need to warm up the unit and uh, remove the water as it will. Um, it's more dense than silicon oil and settle in the bottom. So uh, my own question is, so you mentioned uh, ethanol, uh, silicone oil, and, and I guess ethylene glycol water mixture. What are, is there anything else that uh, people use in terms of uh, fluids? Um, for some heating applications, heating only systems, they might utilize a um, hydrocarbon based heat transfer fluid. Um, the only thing that I would recommend is if they are looking into doing that, please consult with us first from uh, two perspectives. One, we need to make sure uh, that T C you're using has components that are compatible from a materials st uh, compatibility perspective. And secondly, uh, we need to look at the um, viscosity and flash point of, of the fluid to make sure that one, our pumps can uh, move the fluid through the system okay from a viscosity perspective, and two, that the flash point is uh, you know, well enough above the um, desired temperature. All right, Mark, thank you so much for the presentation. That's all the questions so far that we have. Um, just stay on uh, in case there's some more that come later at the end. Uh, Marsha, I'm going to unmute you and uh, give you control. Uh, let's see. Thanks, Mark. And thank you, George. Appreciate everybody sure. being here today. I um, just want to give you a little bit of background on Adam Equipment. 
Um, Adam Equipment was actually founded in 1972 in the UK. Hey, uh, Marcia, uh, do you have your? Uh, I'm just having trouble seeing your slides. Uh, Uh, show the screen. There we go. Just change the where it says display settings. Switch that around. There we go. Is that better? There you go. Yeah, awesome. we're, you're good. I'll, I'm going to mute myself now. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Apologies for that, folks. So, as I was saying, Adam Equipment actually started in 1972, a couple of guys uh, in the UK, and uh, have done so well that they brought um, their company international. And we, about 20 years, we have been here in the. Uh, in the United States, and we have done so well. Uh, we actually, within the last three and a half years, bought a large plot of land and actually built what is our U.S. North America headquarters. And it also has about a 30, 35,000 square foot distribution center. So everything is actually shipped from Oxford, Connecticut. If you need to talk to someone, as Mark was alluding, you are going to be calling the United States. You're actually going to be calling Oxford, Connecticut, and you're going to get a live person. And the whole crux of that is just kind of built on our philosophy, which is to supply reliable, top quality balances and scales that offer uh, the best value, um, a very sharp pencil for the product that you're actually getting. To put it out there, Adam wasn't the top of the, the heap. We weren't the bottom. We were kind of middle of the road, nice, solid, and that has changed with time. We are up there with the big guys now, and yet we are um, staying true to the fact, because we are manufacturers, that we are going to give you a, a product that is, is great in value. So... Um, as I mentioned, it's actually supported by an excellent after-sales service, fully assisting our customers in every way. Our philosophy here in the home office is just this. Um, the cash drawer, when it shuts and the ink dries on the contract, the sale is not over. We are there long after that. Worldwide support, we are actually located, we have six locations in five different continents. And again, um, Oxford, Connecticut is the place to be if you need something in North America. So um, that being said, uh, so you need a balance. Um, what balance and scale, you know, people kind of use the words interchangeably. And for those purposes, that's what we're going to do today. But a scale actually does something totally different than what a balance does. A scale, for instance, is actually going to measure weight where a balance is going to actually measure mass. Um, there is a spring inside of the unit that would actually determine the force. And if you go back to a scale, at least when I was a child, we had two sides. Um, and you would actually put something on one side of the platform, something on the other side of the pan, until they balanced it out to see what it actually weighed. So that really is what a scale was. And um, I'm not going to actually go through this, but this is something that I can print off and send to uh, George, and he can get them out to the attendees. These are some questions that you're going to want to ask yourself when you are going to be weighing something, um, in this case, the can cannabis. Um, how precise does it have to be? Are you sending it off to a lab that where it's going to be medically used? Is it going to be used in a retail environment? Is the weight specific enough so I need a draft shield? And when you see the item that we're featuring today, which are, is our NTAP approved, legal for trade, 
scale um, balance that actually comes with a plastic shield so air does not actually change the measurement. Um, key terminology, you're going to hear this uh, regardless of what capacity you're in. Retail, a grower, in the lab, um, histology, these are actually key definitions and terms that are used throughout what we have found in the balance and the scale industry, and that's capacity. Really simple, the maximum weight that the balance can weigh. The readability is actually the most accurate, the most precise reading that you can see on the screen. And then weighing units, they weigh in all various things, as we know, um, ounces, grams, pounds, carat weights, if you're talking for the jewelry industry. This is a scale that's also popular there. Um, but for the for the purposes of our conversation, cannabis is weighed in ounces. And then the important the pan size of the platform, ours are stainless steel. That's the size of the weighing area. And why that is important is just because of the fact um, you usually need a pan that's going to absolutely hold what you're actually weighing. Um, applications in science, you know, if this is going to be up for a lab environment, as the end user, for example, um, Smith Klein Glaxo, they're using it for um, high precision for medical um, medical cannabis that's going to be used with cancer patients as uh, part of a treatment plan. You're going to use need high precision. Um, these typical users are going to be science chemists, biologists, lab technicians, researchers. Um, and there you're going to want to stay with common products that are very analytical or precision. They're going to read to one decimal point. They're going to read to one milligram, ten milligrams, or a tenth of a gram. Um, again, these are probably things that are going to be eventually regulated by the FDA. So these users are chemicals, drugs, um, food ingredients. This is a scale that, because it's legal for trade, is also very popular in the spice and in the food industry. But it's always going to be, whenever you get research, material, properties, documents, you hear those words, you're going to want to be precise. And applications and research are going to weigh small amounts, high precision. Um, common products are going to be precision balances, like our... Um, our Dune, um, our Nimbus, uh, because of the fact that uh, they're going to come up with a measurement that's going to be one milligram, ten milligrams, one a tenth of a gram. It's ideal for measuring chemicals to learn characteristics of materials and reactions. And think about what a material is actually weighed in, for instance. Um, because there is a tear feature that always zeroes a balance out, you can have a liquid. We are not just, um, we're not limiting ourselves to weighing the cannabis plant or the buds, for instance. You can, once it's extracted and once it's done everything that Mark has talked about, you can weigh it in liquid form, in powder form, which is really important. And at this point, we're going to talk about some weights and measurement requirements. And Tim is the expert on this, so we're going to slide it over to Tim. Thank you, Marsha. Appreciate that. Yeah, so um, regulations. I get the fun topic, right? I'm not going to, hopefully, not going to bore you too much to death about the regs. Um, I think one thing we did want to point out about it, though, is that in this industry, I think everyone's aware it's very highly regulated, especially since it's new. Um, it probably will continue to be highly regulated. This is just one example of one state's regulation of, what are there now, 29 that allow medicinal, recreational, or recreational cannabis. So it gives you an idea as to the scope of what they're asking. Um, so it's very important when you pick out a balance that you're picking out the right one that fits in, meets the regulations, um, so that if you do get audited, you know, you don't get shut down, quite frankly. So. Um, something worth mentioning on this is you've got a couple of options. You've got scales that are used for, essentially, we'll talk a little bit about NTEP, and Marsha mentioned that already. But one of the things they talk about when they talk about NTEP, which is National Pipe Evaluation Program, is that 
essentially it's a standard that the balances have to be have to meet or exceed in order for somebody to use that uh, balance as legal for trade. So Marsha touched on it earlier. Um, you know, we have all kinds of balances as a company. We have analytical balances, which are used in the lab type settings, um, you know, where they're measuring uh, very minute uh, measurements. Moisture analyzers, which can determine the, just that as it sounds, the moisture of, of the product. Precision balances. So today we essentially are going to really focus a little bit more on the retail and dispensary side of things. So that's, you know, hence us kind of going into this and we're going to, we'll talk about one product in particular, but again, should you need more information, you know, George can, can route questions over to us and, uh, you know, Marsha or I would be able to help you out with that. So uh, just last thing I want to mention on here is the, the class two scale. Um, there, the parts that are highlighted over on the right hand side there, there, there are class three NTEP regulated or, or NTEP approved class three scales that are very often used in retail um, applications like a deli counter or something like that. That's, those are sufficient for that, but for this particular industry, they, are, they do not suffice. So if, if you're seeing, hey, there's an NTEP rated scale out here, well, this one's less expensive, that may very well be why. These are, these are held to more rigid standards when they meet this class two requirement. And in the yellow there, it gives you an idea as to what that means. I mean, we're talking about a, a product that potentially could be $320 per ounce. Um, if you're off by 25% plus or minus, you're lose, potentially losing a ton of money. So it's very important that you get the class two MTAP. So we'll go into one that, we, that we're that we gonna discuss. And Marcia, if you don't mind going up to the next slide there. Um, this in particular is really, we, we went to the back of the drawing board. Uh, we have, a, an, have had an existing Highland portable precision balance for years. Uh, but we we essentially broke that down, uh, went back to R and D, and determined, hey, how do we, you know, we need we need this to be an NTEP certified product for this particular industry because it meets those key key things, those key definitions that Marsha talked about earlier, with regard to the capacity, which is how much it weighs, the readability, how fine a number it weighs to, and the pan size, um, and some other features and benefits that are part of this, which I'll go into. Um, so it, this is essentially designed for the cannabis industry, specifically retail, specifically um, dispensaries. Um, last thing worth mentioning on here before we move on is essentially the long and the short of it is, I think we touched on it already, but it's undergone stringent tests, the last bullet there, um, to ensure that it's accurate and it's, and it's um, legal for trade and it'll work for this, you know, for this function. So just again, briefly, I know it's sort of the dry stuff that's involved here. It's not not the exciting stuff, but it's really it's critical. Again, if you want to avoid um, regulators breathing down your neck, just hammering home the point that class two is what you need at a minimum uh, when getting, uh, you know, whether it be in jewelry, cannabis, or very specific industries that want to be sure that. If you're putting something on that scale, it actually legally measures out the amount that you're saying it does. Um, so that's that's sort of the point here. And then when it comes to um, the class two approval, again, this is this is a bit more information on that. Um, but essentially, if you look toward the top section, uh, the the sort of bar graph where it says class two, gives you an indication as to what capacity, you know, the one to fifty milligrams sometimes greater than 100 milligrams, but what division or what readability we need. So that's that's sort of where this Highland, or you see it toward the bottom, it's HCB and various numbers after that. Those are different variations of this particular product. So when looking to order something like this, George can get it for you, you know, we can get it for him as well, um, but it'll have Highland HCB 103A, for instance. That just tells us how much capacity, 100 grams in that case, and how much readability. Uh, which is, uh, in this case, the legal for trade part is 0 0.01 grams. So moving on to some key points, you you see them there. You don't need me to read them to you, but some some key parts of this that really um, I think are important, worth mentioning, are the part toward the top there. You know, dispensaries, um, retail shops, uh, specifically. That's what this is designed for. The second point. You know, yes, it's portable, which is great. You can move it around from place to place, which ties into the, the fact that it has a rechargeable battery, AC adapter. So you can move it around from place to place. Um, and then you have a, an option to lock the, uh, 
you know, there, there's a locking mechanism that's optional as well um, for when you are storing the, you know, storing the balance. Um, and then the other things Marsha mentioned, the ounces are, um, if you just hit the left button, yeah, Marcia, it'll sorry, go back. That. That's okay. Um, just, just one or two other things on this. The, the ounces, the key units for legal for trade, typically it's going to be ounces, as Marsha mentioned earlier. And then when it comes to stackability, this product is great in the event that you have a larger facility, you need multiple units, but you don't want to, you don't want to take up all the shelf space. So you could stack these and they'll, they'll rest fine. The shock protect, uh, technology. What that references is, is um, if you think of a balance, uh, which is a, a more delicate scale to sort of simplify it, um, many balances are very delicate um, as opposed to like a large crane scale or a large platform scale or something like that. They're typically very, very delicate. This particular product has the readability of a precision balance, which is very good and, and meant for this, um, but it has shock protect, which essentially is a patented technology that allows us to, you know, you could be pretty rough with it is the point. Um, that's, and that's pretty much it. Competitively priced, of course, as, as all of our products are through T equipment and, um, you know, the warranties come with it as well. So then you've got, um, some accessories. Uh, again, I'm not going to read through these. A couple of things worth mentioning again, just the, the Kensington type block and cable. Uh, many folks, especially in this industry will, will, you utilize that sort of thing as well as the data collection program uh, which allows them to download uh, any data to excel for when they're tracking the information which is critical uh, in a very highly regulated industry so uh, the others are obviously available as well so then then we've just got really a screenshot which we can provide this information for anybody should they want this after the after the webinar or any time in the future uh, Marsha has this information at her fingertips George does as well um, and essentially what it is is details of some features, some benefits, some specifications of the product, uh, and then the, the suggested uh, list prices as well, and, and pan sizes and things like that. So we'll move on. We, you know, we mentioned, we talked about NTEP uh, being the sort of the rule of thumb that you need an NTEP, again, class two, not just NTEP, but class two for this application. But should somebody have need, have the need for weighing uh, larger containers, uh, a carton or a larger box of product, um, or even from the fields or from the, or from the, uh, the grow area, you could, you could get some of these larger NTEP approved products that we have as well. Uh, and then there's some other retail versions of it also. And then last but not least, just, just kind of wanted to plug some new things. So we appreciate the time from everyone. But again, just real quick, we've got a number of new products as we typically do coming out throughout the year. The, the top ones there uh, fit pretty well into this conversation today, which are used more in the laboratory type settings. So if somebody really um, is in that end of the industry, um, maybe the oils that Marsha mentioned earlier or, or measuring very fine increments, those are available um, through Atom Equipment as well. So that's, um, for the most part, what we've got. But obviously, if anyone has any questions for us, we're here now. But also, you know, things could be routed through George should you need anything uh, beyond that. And Marsha and I can help you out. Thank you both. Uh, great, great presentation. Uh, I do have uh, one question. And if there's any that come up while we're uh, talking, um, please use the chat window. Uh, so if if a person's in Canada, is there something similar to NTEP for Canada? And, and I'll just add, you know, internationally, what how do you guys handle, uh, I guess, class two? Yeah, no, great question. Um, the long and the short of it is, yes, there are. There are so every, um, not every country, but many regions will have their own type of approval. So again, to your point, George, the NTEP uh, is National Conference on Weights and Measures, which is, a United States entity that does these approvals. Um, and again, that's what this product in particular is, is uh, geared toward. Canada has something called Measurement Canada, which is long and the short of it is very similar concept to NTEP, just their version of it. Um, this particular product for us isn't currently, um, doesn't have that rating currently, but there's a possibility we'll get that with some of our products as well. Um, obviously, I'm sure there are a number of folks that you know, maybe on the line and, and also, um, you know, talk to T equipment and, and ask about that. So yeah, it's something worth, worth mentioning. Um, again, keep in mind that the ratings, those are for legal for trade applications, which is very important in the retail end of it, in the dispensary end of it. 
Um, there are many other balances that we can offer for other applications. And then to your other question, which is more internationally, outside of Canada, outside of the U.S., South America, Central America, Europe, et cetera, we have a number of balances. What they go by is what's called OIML, uh, just another, another certification process, essentially. And we have a number of products that meet those standards. Being that Marsha and I focus, again, we're headquartered in Connecticut in the Northeast, uh, and we focus on the United States, um, those would be something that we would be able to help people with, but we would route you to our, our counterparts in our UK home office. So hopefully that, I'm not sure if I answered all the questions or if, if you have follow-ups or anything like that, that's fine. Yeah, that's that's fine for now. Uh, again, anyone can always come back to us. Uh, there was a question about one of the slides where you had the scales and there was the little D and the little E. Uh, what is the those uh, lowercase d and e refer to? Slide eleven. Yeah, I'll just I'll just ask Marsha to switch it back if we're still sharing our screen uh, screen to slide yeah, eleven. Still, yeah, it's still. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. That's there. It is. Yeah. So. Okay. So at the bottom there. Yeah. That yeah. we get that frequently, and I I must have glazed right over that. But um, yeah. So essentially, what it is, I guess the easiest way to explain it is if you look at uh, the HCB 103A first one on the bottom left. Um, and, and so the question for those who missed that is, what does that D refer to and what does that E refer to? So first off, I'll start with the 100 gram. So the 100 gram essentially is the capacity. That, that this balance will hold a maximum of 100 grams of product on it. Um, the readability that's NTEP approved, again, legal for trade approved, is the lower number, the, the E. So the 0 0.01 grams. So for NTEP approval, this HCB 103A is, will read 100 up to 100 grams capacity and 0 0.01 grams readability, which is definitely more than sufficient for, for the application that we're talking about. But to explain what the D means, um, again, the long and the short of it is the D is essentially stating that the, the balance will actually show a readability of 0 0.001. Um, but to be used for legal for trade, we take it to the next decimal point. So that's that's really all that is. So hopefully, I don't know if that clarified it or or if I confused people a bit more on that or not. No, it's it's good. Um, one last question: uh, Are the scales uh, calibrated when they leave the factory? Especially these NTEP ones, I guess, is the concern. Yeah, no, that's a make that makes sense. Real, very legitimate question. Um, so. Not just the NTEP ones, I'll, I'll speak generally, but, but this includes the NTEP ones as well. So if someone were to get, for instance, an analytical balance for, from us uh, for their laboratory application, which is even reading in a much higher readability than these that we're talking about today, um, or one of the ones that we're talking about today, you know, the Highland uh, specifically, um, they are, um, they, they can be calibrated at our facility here. But something worth mentioning, especially when it comes to the analytical side, not as much with these. If I calibrate a balance in Connecticut at, I don't know, 1,000 feet above sea level, thereabouts, um, and I purchase that and I bring it to Colorado and I'm at 8,000 feet above sea level, it's calibrated at, at my current altitude where I come. So what I think that hopefully clarifies it, but what most folks do and the best practice is when you purchase it, we typically recommend that you have it calibrated. And even beyond that, uh, especially since it's a legal for trade application, like George mentioned, um, and it's important and heavily, um, you know, a, a regulated industry, is for that situation, you you would want to have periodic calibrations done to it. So if we're talking about the, the NTEP Highland, for instance, which is a precision balance, not an analytical, which is, which is a little higher. Um, kind of end model. The precision balance, typically maximum once a month, people will have a service come out and calibrate, or you can calibrate them yourselves um, if, if you get the, the proper weights. And if it's an analytical, again, once a month probably suffices. Many people, many of our customers will have calibration services come out on a quarterly basis. So honestly, it's up to the individual. But again, since this is a regulated industry, I'd recommend monthly. Tim, Marcia, thank you. Um, one, I was going to talk, uh, run through a few, a few slides uh, talking about some other 
instruments. I wasn't going to go into a great detail, but they're all related instruments. Uh, the first one that I was going to talk about was a portable moisture meter, but I, I just wanted you guys to touch briefly that you can measure moisture using a scale. I think you mentioned it in your talk, Tim. Can you just explain what that is, and then I'll, I'll explain how a portable meter would work. Yeah, definitely, George. Yeah, and, and yep, I did mention it. Um, again, we have a number of balances scales. This this particular one, um, I think you were talking about a moisture meter. For us at Adam Equipment, it's a moisture analyzer. Um, so essentially, in order to detect or to, to determine moisture um, from any, say, farm product, agricultural product, people a lot of times need to determine that. Sometimes it's used in the food industry to determine the moisture content in cheeses and things like that. Um, the old fashioned way to do it was literally to have the product in an oven for a prescribed amount of time to dry it out, to, de to dehydrate it, take, well, actually back up, take a measurement prior to drying it out, a, a weight of it, put it in the oven, which is a very time consuming process, dehydrate, then remeasure it or reweigh it um, to determine the moisture content just through some math equations. Um, the moisture analyzer that I was referring to earlier is a product that we have that, that sells very well for this reason because it, it speeds up the process exponentially. You could put a, um, you know, say a bud of cannabis inside the moisture analyzer, set it to the prescribed time settings and do exactly what I said regarding the oven, determine the, the, it does the weighing for it right on the scale, large screen, very easy to read. And then once it once it dries or once it dehydrates, it'll do another measurement, and you've got your you've got your uh, numbers right in front of you. So it's it's sort of a shortcut uh, for determining you know the moisture. So that's that's sort of our end of it. But I know George, you have other products as well. So so have at it. Yeah, that that's the the lead into um, what we, uh, yeah sh uh, uh, showing. Uh, uh, can you guys see my screen, oh. Tim? Oh, I think should, oh, you know what we should that? we'll hit stop or pause and then uh, and then get out of it. I think maybe we're stuck showing ours. Yeah, I should be back. Um, yeah, we we carry a variety of portable handheld uh, moisture meters for a variety of uh, industrial and agricultural applications. Uh, I contacted uh, Delmhurst, one of the companies that we represent, um, and they have this, uh, the one that you see pictured here, it's a meter in intended for hay, and it's the closest one that we've found and they have found that will actually uh, cover the moisture range for cannabis. Uh, as you can see, their unit goes down as low as 8%, and their experience with uh, customers uh, in this industry, they sometimes want to go down to 6%, but certainly low moisture. So what you're looking at right there is just the meter by itself, and then the probes come as attachments. And so here's uh, three different types of attachments. One, the one on the uh, far left is a two-inch disc with small pins. The center one is a cup style. And then the far right style is a, a different type of surface uh, contact uh, one. Uh, you often put those in uh, like a paint can and then you, you, you put pro your product in there. Uh, you need some density and you push down on it with the uh, uh, either the, the far right or far left uh, probe. Um, there's also longer probes if you're going to be putting them into a batch uh, of some type. So there's a variety of lengths that are available. So I just wanted to um, give you that as a as an alternative um, to take a look at and consider. Uh, we also carry some basic um, scientific laboratory equipment. So it, I'm not going to get into details, but you can see from the pictures, you got hot plates and mantles and vacuum pump and the centrifuge. So there's a, a wide variety of microscopes that we carry, uh, pipettes and other uh, lab uh, type of uh, equipment. And here on this slide is more industrial instruments uh, that we carry. So we have pressure gauges and transducers. If you want to measure the vacuum, you actually measure the, the amount of vacuum or pressure in the process. Uh, if you want to record the uh, variables like temperature and pressure, there's a shown here, uh, uh, right here is a little portable data logger. This is a chart recorder that on the, uh, to the right of it uh, with a 
paper chart. Uh, it's typical for any FDA regulated industry, like a food or pharmaceutical, to want to uh, have a paper trail. And you, we can bring in uh, inputs for temperature and pressure and other uh, variables. Uh, there's also, if you're in a growing area or some other uh, a- applications where you need to measure uh, room temperature and humidity, uh, there's a variety of instruments that we offer for that. Uh, if you want a, uh, if you're don't, if you're doing your own heating control, there's temperature controllers. We also have thermometers. Uh, there's a if you're building your own panel and your own control system, we have multi-channel controllers and a variety of components that go into an electrical panel that you see there. So that concludes kind of the, the webinar. Um, I, if there's any additional questions, now uh, you can put them in through the, the chat window in the uh, presentation uh, mode here. Uh, just want to thank you for attending uh, while we're waiting for questions. And I also wanted to thank our presenters, Mark Diener from Jalabo, uh, Marsha and Tim uh, from Adam Equipment. Uh, well done, everybody. And uh, I don't see any questions, and we're, we're basically running over time here, so I'll just close out the, the webinar. I did want to mention that you will get a copy emailed to you of the once we post it on YouTube, as well as a, uh, you could visit this link uh, down at the bottom here and in the documents section, all, all of the s- slides are uh, there on PDF. Uh, and uh, again, everyone, thank you so much. I'll uh, close down the webinar now. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.